But I do believe that I have a word to share this evening. Uh, you know, I was kind of praying about it this past week, and, uh, you know, there's, uh, from me coming back from my background where I came from, and uh, really, uh, I was deep, deep in the world, and, you know, it was just a real difficult way out for me. It, getting out of the world was really hard for me, and uh, it, it was a long struggle. It was, uh, uh, I had a bout with drugs and, and just all different types of stuff. Darkness was over my life. And, and as I think back on what it was that was one of the things that really got me into the trouble that I was in, and then whenever I kind of understood this truth with, and learned about it and, and kind of practiced these steps that I'm going to uh, give you tonight, I was able to, to come out of it with God's grace, with God's help. He rescued me. He saved me. He pulled me out of it. It was a beautiful thing. But really, the title of this message tonight is The Power Struggle. And you know, we as as human beings, part of the human condition that we have as humans is this power struggle, this desire that each of us have to really to do our own thing. And it can be traced all the way back to the beginning. And so I'm going to start this evening in Genesis chapter 3. So if you want to turn there to Genesis chapter 3, I'm going to read a few verses there. Reading from a paper Bible. It's awesome. It's about to fall apart, but it's good. I thought I'd mix it up a little bit. Uh, but Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 says this. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We must not eat from the tr- We may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say that we must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And so there's really two things that when uh, Satan was offering these things up and kind of telling Eve that he was giving her this secret, this thing, that he would be able, she would be able to be like God, there was really some truth to that. And, and he, was, he was trying to, to dupe her into believing that she could be God. But really what he was saying was that there's two things. One, that you would know that there is good and evil. You see, before this time, Eve and a- Adam and Eve, they were living in a garden of bliss. There was no sin in the world yet. They didn't even really have a concept of good and evil. And so this reality for her was that she would know good and evil. She would know that good and evil existed. And she had only known good till then. But the other thing that I want to focus on tonight is what Satan was offering her and what was part of the curse after the fall was that she and Adam would be able to decide for themselves what is right and wrong. So it wasn't simply the knowledge that good and evil existed, but it was really he was offering to her this, this thing to, to that she would be able to decide for herself what was right and what was wrong. And, you know, this has been the power struggle now for us since the beginning. You know, we're children of Adam, so we, this, this uh, curse on Adam and Eve has been handed down to us over all generations, and now we're experiencing the same thing. You know, we experience this, this desire that we, you know, there's this innate desire inside of each of us as humans to not do, want to do what we're told to do, but to want to do what we want to do. Yeah. Do you feel that? And so, uh, so really, that's what he's offering her. He, and, and when you study that out, you can find that, that that's what he was doing. He was giving, giving her the offer for her to be able to decide what was right and wrong. And really, it's something that's, that's affected us ever since. And so our power struggle as humans is just that, that we innately want what we want. We don't like to be told what to do. It's like whenever I was a kid, I remember oftentimes, and you may remember this, and I'm sure you do, and you as parents have said this a lot, I was often told to go clean my room. I really didn't want to clean my room. And it wasn't so much that I didn't like the cleaning, although I didn't. And it wasn't so much that, you know, uh, I didn't want my room to be clean, but it was that I did not want to be told what to do. I really wanted to go my own way. And this has caused many, many problems. I mean, it's really the source of, of much of our problems in the world today. It's the cause of wars. It's the cause of murders, adultery. Uh, all sorts of sin, really they can be traced back to this truth. We want to do what we want to do. We want to be the baller, 
shot caller, if I may. We want to call the shots, do we not? I could tell who remembers that song out there. Uh, and you're surprised that I know that song, I'm sure, but that's all right. So there's really three main areas where we struggle with this. Uh, and, and they're very simple, but our three main areas that we struggle in this is our relationship with God, our relationship with others, and then in the marriage relationship. The marriage relationship. And so, uh, you know, and I'll start with number three. As, as married couples, this has been really the source of probably most divorces out there. You know, they'll, they'll put on the, the divorce decree or whatever, irreconcilable differences. Well, translated down into the Greek, it means I want to do what I want to do. I don't want to be told what to do. And so this is something that, that me and Lisa struggled with for many, many years, and, and, and we still do. It's, it's, a, you know, it's a constant battle. And that's the thing about this part of our human condition is that it's a struggle that we're going to face until the day we go home to be with Jesus. We're not going to conquer it here on this earth, but what we can do is we can, we can begin to get victory over it. We can begin to get better at it. We can begin through exercise and all those things, like what Pastor Mike was talking about this week, this past Sunday, is we can, we can begin to gain victory over it, and it'll be less and less of an opportunity for the enemy to trip us up. It'll be less and less of an opportunity for us to wreck our own lives and to cause ourselves a lot of trouble. And so uh, this, this idea of, of the marriage, and it's really a deception in marriage. There's a, there's a little uh, deception going through the body of Christ and has for many years that says that because of the fall of man, that the woman wants to rule over the man. But really, that's only part of the truth. Really, the truth is, is we both want to rule over each other. We both have this human condition, this power struggle within us that causes us to want to be in control. It causes us to want to call the shots. And so tonight I want to kind of look at a few ways that we can kind of get beyond that and kind of uh, achieve some success in this area. And it, and it really, there's, there's going to be three, I'm going to give us three directives that we can look at tonight. Three directives. And if I missed any of the, uh, I'm not as good as, as Pastor Mike is at this, at, uh, filling in all the blanks, but I think I'm doing pretty good. Oh, let me back up. This is the truth of it. Victory, and this is on your handout, victory comes by way of s surrender. That's a bit of a contradiction, you know, but victory truly comes by way of surrender. As we begin to and engage in surrendering our will, our emotions, our desires to God, as we as we do that, and as we begin to get a greater level of, su of success in doing that, we're going to find that we have a greater level of success in this power struggle as well. And it's going to cause us to be able to overcome this. And so, uh, James chapter 1, verse 5. I'm going to get to that in a minute. But James chapter 1, verse 5. I'm going to start in Proverbs, actually. So our directive is this tonight. This, these are our directives. How do we surrender our soul to God? How do we surrender in this power struggle. And in Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6, this is what it says. One of my favorite verses, really a life verse for me. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. He will make your path straight. You know, I love the idea of going down a straight path. No one can sneak up on you. You can see what's coming. A curved path you never know what's around the next corner. But God wants to give us straight paths. God wants to cause us to go down straight, straight paths. And this, this power struggle that we're engaged in is really a big opportunity to be tripped up in our lives. And it really will trip us up. So the first thing we need to do, this is our directives. The first thing we need to do is we need to acknowledge our condition. Acknowledge our condition. So we need to admit that we struggle in this area. It's really, it's really just calling it like it is. We as humans, we say, God, I know I struggle in this area. I know I want to be in control. I know I want to get my own way. But God, I want to submit my heart to you. So the first thing we do is we acknowledge our condition. You know, in AA and any of these other uh, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous and all this, the first step in the 12-step program is to admit that we are powerless over our addiction or over that problem. And so we need to come to that point as Christians, as believers, where we say, you know, God, I know you saved me. I know you delivered me.
but God, I know I struggle in this area. I know it's difficult, and I just want to acknowledge that today. But secondly, we need to access godly wisdom. We need to access godly wisdom. There's James 1.5. It says, if any lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives liberally to all without finding fault. Who gives liberally to all without finding fault. And so how do we access godly wisdom? Anyone? Read the Bible in the scriptures. What's another way we access godly wisdom? Through prayer, right? Through prayer, through counsel, through godly counsel. And so uh, as we talk about godly counsel, this is one of the things that, that really helped me in my life. It's just the opportunity that I had to call on people, to engage in the church, to be a part of the body of Christ and allow God to bring godly men and women into my life and help me in many, many areas. And, and another thing that I did early on in my walk was I began to study through Proverbs. Proverbs is just, just a great, it's just really, it's God's book of wisdom for us. It's his, it's his expression to, tell, to show us how we live, how we can submit to him, how we can live our life, how we can keep from getting tripped up. And it's just, a, it's just a beautiful opportunity for us to read through Proverbs. There's 30 Proverbs, or 31 Proverbs, for each, one for each day of the month, and just go through that and begin to read those each day. And I promise you this, and I've experienced this over and over, you'll need those nuggets that you gain that day. You'll end up needing them sometime that day. It almost never fails, where it's like something will happen in my day, and I can go back to something I read that morning in Proverbs. And it's just a beautiful opportunity for me to, to experience God's direction in that way. And there's so much truth in Proverbs. There, there really is. And I, I'd like to demonstrate the, the reality and the truth, of just how practical Proverbs is. If I could get maybe a volunteer, somebody that's brave, courageous. There he is right there, and he's in the front row. What, what's your name, bud? Omar. This is Omar. So I'm going to read a Proverbs, and then you're going to help me to prove that it's, that it's true. Uh, Proverbs uh, 30, 33 says this, the ringing of the nose bringeth forth blood. Okay, so we're going to, maybe I picked the wrong guy. <laughs> maybe he's going to demonstrate it to me. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But thank you. Thank you, Omar, for coming on up. Let's give it a hand for Omar. He was, he was willing. I did pick the wrong guy. Go. I should have picked the short guy, the small guy. All right. Thank you, Omar. Appreciate that. But Proverbs is just awesome. There's just so many, there's just, just so rich. It's just, you know, you never, you never go away from reading a Proverbs in the morning and end up not utilizing it in your day. It's just a beautiful thing. Number three of our directives to gain victory in this power struggle is to follow through. Follow through. You know, one of the things... Uh, that I like to tell some of my guys, I have some guys that work for me, and uh, you know, I've had the opportunity to be an employee many times. I've had an opportunity to be a boss, you know, an actual boss, not that type of boss, not a boss you know, but a boss. <laughs> and, uh, and so one of the things that I've told my guys and one of the things that we'll tell our customers is we do what's right because it's right. So as we, as we begin to kind of focus our heart towards God, and, and just work on doing what's right because it's right. And let God work out the rest. Let God work out the details. You'll, you'll, you'll never go wrong that way. You know? It's just, it's, it's, it's worked for me so many times. So when we turn our hearts towards God, when we surrender our heart to God and strive to please Him, check this out, He'll change our heart. And so this idea that we that we don't get to do what we want, this idea that, you know, this power struggle that we're all going, going through, that we're all experiencing, it, whenever we allow God to change our heart, whenever we turn our heart towards him and allow him to work on our heart, he'll ch the Bible says that he'll change the desires of our heart or he'll give us the desires of our heart. And what that actually means is that he will change our desires. So that's a beautiful thing. And for me, I needed my desires to be changed because my desires were going far away from God. Any of you with me on that? In our, in our past, our desires were going away from God. Our desire wasn't to please God. We were, we were enemies of God. And so what I needed was I need God to change my heart, to give me 
a different desire so that it wasn't just me trying to white knuckle my way through life or just adjust my behavior by willpower, but I, I needed a heart change. And that heart change came for me as I began to walk out the wisdom in the Bible, the wisdom that I gained from coming to church and hearing the, the teaching of the scriptures, all that, that's whenever my heart began to change. And so if you find yourself not able to adjust your behavior, not able to change your behavior, it's got to be a matter of the heart. And so we need, to change, we need to allow God to change our heart. And when we can allow God to change our heart, then he'll change our desires. And then it's just us following God. It's us following our heart as our heart follows God, rather than us trying to just, just willpower change our behavior. You know, in AA and NA and all those self-help and support groups, this is what they'll tell you. You're not going to just white knuckle your way through it. You're not going to willpower your way to stop drinking every single day. You're not going to willpower your way out of doing cocaine. You're not going to willpower your way out of hitting your spouse or hitting, beating your children. You're not going to willpower your way out of not being angry if you've got anger issues. It really is a matter of the heart. And so one of the things that we make a mistake doing, even in the body of Christ, is we just try to say, okay, I just got to do what's right. I just got to stop doing this and start doing this. And there's a degree of truth to that. But unless our heart is changed by God, unless our heart is changed by the Spirit of God from the inside out, we're not going to be able to white knuckle our way through. We're not going to be able to willpower our way through. We've got to let God change our heart. And so this is my directive from God is to come tonight to tell you if you're struggling with something, if you're having difficulty stopping something or doing something that you should be doing, allow God to change your heart. Amen? Allow God to change your heart. And these are some of the practices that we need in our life in order for God to change our heart. We need to acknowledge our condition. We need to say, God, I'm a mess. We need to stop faking it till we make it and just tell God straight up the truth. God, I'm a mess. I can't control my anger. I can't control my drug habit. I can't control my own life, God. God, I acknowledge that I can't do it without you. Just tell him that. And then begin to access that wisdom. Begin to access it. There are so many people in this room that I can look to, and I've said this before, but man, it's so true, that I can look to and say, that person mentored me. That person helped me. That person prayed for me. Man, we need it, don't we? We certainly need it. I got a call from a brother today that he's got, he's got a lot of things going on. He's got issues with, with one of his children. He's got issues with his wife. He doesn't know what to do. And the only thing I can say to do is, man, let's pray. Let's seek God. Let's seek godly counsel from God himself and see what God would do. Whenever we can surrender that to him, whenever we begin to gain victory through that surrender, we're going to see God begin to change our heart. And this is the other cool thing. As God changes our hearts and begins to move us in a direction, then God also works on the circumstances as well. If you've got circumstances that are piling on you, even if it's due to your own behavior or just due to something that somebody else imposed on you, man, begin to walk with God and begin to see God change your situation. Begin to see God change your circumstances. It's, it's a pretty amazing thing, and it'll build your faith and it'll cause you to say, you know what, man, I think God is going to rescue me. And your faith begins to build and your hope begins to build. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Ecclesiastes 10.3 says this, it says, even when a fool walks along, along the way, he lacks wisdom and he shows that he is a fool. You know, I've, I've been that fool. And everybody knew it. I just thought they didn't. I thought I had them fooled. But they knew. This, this, this verse is telling us that, that even when a fool walks along the way and he lacks wisdom, he shows that he's a fool. James 1.5 again says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives liberally to all without finding fault. You know, God's not going to berate you. God's not going to read you the riot act. When we come humbly asking for wisdom, that's the greatest thing that we can ask of God as Christians. It's not, you know, God changed that woman you gave me. It's not God 
change my circumstances. It's not God, give me a better boss. It's not any of those things. It's God, give me wisdom. How do I walk this thing out? How do I, how do I walk this thing out? How do I do so in a way that first honors you and then secondly takes care of what I need to take care of? Beautiful. Second Timothy 3.16 says this. It says, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Listen, if you haven't embarked on this journey with God through his word, through the scriptures, I just want to encourage you. That's, that's our access point to God. You know, oftentimes we ask God for direction in a certain situation. Well, he's written down the answer in his word. And so sometimes you might hear God ask you this, have you sought it in my word? Have you sought out your answer in my word? Have you, have you sought that answer? Because it's there. God's given everything we need in the scriptures for us, for business, for relationships. It's all there. It's all there. You know, me as a, as a boss, when I, when I look to hire someone, I evaluate people and I evaluate my employees this way. One of the main things I look for is are they sub- able to submit? Are they able, not that I want robots, not that I want just guys that are just going to just do what I say to do blindly. I want to have their opinion. I want them to give input, all those things. But whenever push comes to shove and I ask them to do something, are they going to be able to submit to that? Because the level, the degree that a person's able to submit as an employee is directly proportional to how successful they are as an employee. Get that? How, how much we're able to submit is directly proportional to how effective we are as an employee. And it's the same with our Christian walk. The degree that we're able to submit to the will of God over our own will is, ex- is directly proportional to how effective we are as believers. Not only living our own life successfully and living well and demonstrating that to others, but being able to lead others into that same relationship that we experience with God to experience that love, to experience that, that uh, direction from God, to experience that hope that we can have as believers. So that's the, that's the main thing I look for uh, with employees, you know? And that's what God's looking for for us. He's looking for some surrender. So the benefit to this, what's the benefit? Well, one of the benefits is a greater relationship with God. It's a greater relationship with others. There's really no downside, you know, where our walk becomes better and better, and listen, the longer you walk with God, the longer you stay engaged with God, the better your walk will be. It doesn't mean it's going to be an easier walk. Generally, it's, our walk can even be, we go through seasons of really difficult times. But as we continue to engage with God, our relationship with him will get sweeter and sweeter and better and better. And your relationship with others, with family members, with friends, it'll get stronger. And your relationship with your spouse, with your wife, with your husband, will just get sweeter and sweeter as time goes by. Sure, it's difficult. Sure, this life is, is, listen, we're living in a godless society. They're pushing God in the existence and the, 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 you know, just the very talk, the very presence, the very name of God. They're trying to push it out of everything. And so we carry the power of God on the inside of us. We carry his presence. We carry his love. We carry his life on the inside of us. And as we continue to submit our lives to him, as we continue to walk closer and closer to him, it's going to cause us to be able to bring more and more people in with us because that's the only thing we can take with us to heaven. I can't take my four by four to heaven. Maybe there's four by fours in heaven. There's got to be some four by fours in heaven, right? There's got to be some mud pits in heaven. There's got to be something like that. But we're not going to take that stuff with us. We're only going to take people, friends, family, loved ones. So that's the beauty of this thing, you know. Uh, God can change our heart, man. And I've, I've experienced that heart change by God. I've experienced that one day I wanted to live a, a certain way. I wanted to engage in certain things. I wanted to do certain things. And then as I walked with him for a little bit, I, I be, it began to change. 
You know, I got, I, I got free of cocaine gradually. I would, yeah, thank God, thank God. My wife thanks God. But it wasn't something that, you know, God just touched me and, and, and I was done with it. Now, that's happened. I've known people that that's happened with. Uh, I've known people that, you know, have been alcoholics and God touched them and, and changed them and delivered them and they stopped drinking alcohol that day and it was, it was done. It wasn't like that for me. God took me through a process, you know. And, uh, like, there's a guy that, that's worked for me for many years and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell a story about him real quick. I wasn't going to, but I am. I ministered to this guy and witnessed to him probably for about five or six years. And he would say the same thing. He would say, man, he's like, I know it's right. I know it's true, but I just don't want to give up this, this, and this, and this. I mean, he was, you know, he didn't dislike God. He knew God was the right way. He knew Jesus Christ was the only way to God. But he just didn't want to give up certain things. And so I would witness to him and talk to him, and we would just have conversations. And about two weeks went by, and he, he didn't do any work for me. He was a subcontractor for me. And uh, I didn't see him for a while, and then we got together and talked, and he said, hey, I want to tell you something. I said, okay. He said, I went to church this weekend, and I got saved. And I said, you turkey. I've been ministering to you for years, man, and you're going to let somebody else lead you to Jesus? And then I was done with it, and I said, man, that's just amazing. And so knowing this, that just the things that I was able to share with him, that was part of watering that seed. That was part of, of you know, somebody planted that seed in his life many, many years ago, and it lay dormant for a long time. And then I began to water that seed a little bit, and somebody else watered that seed, and then somebody else pulled the plant off the vine and received the harvest. But really, I shared in that harvest. I'm sharing in the benefit of it. The guy's one of my best employees, and it's awesome. And to see what God did in this man's life, that day, this guy was, was such a bad alcoholic that he would wake up and kind of sleepwalk in a daze in the middle of the night because he needed to drink. He needed to get a beer or two in him so he could finish his night's sleep. Now, that's bad. God touched that man, and that dude stopped drinking that day and never drank again. And that's been almost 10 years. So it's, it's, it's just amazing what God will do for a heart that turns towards him, for a heart that's surrendered to him. You know, that man held on to just his own little desires, that condition, that human condition that we all have, that he wanted to call the shots in his own life. He wanted to make his own decisions. He wanted to feed his flesh. And it, his life was completely unmanageable. But the day he turned his heart fully towards God, God delivered him like a lightning bolt. And it was, a, it was a miracle. It was an amazing thing. And so I don't know where each of us are tonight. I know where I am. I don't know where each of you are in this walk with God, in this power struggle. But I do know this, this power struggle, it really does go back before even Adam and Eve. It, come, it goes back to Satan goes back to Lucifer. He wanted to be God. And the job wasn't available. So he was mad because he couldn't be God. And so it got him kicked out of heaven. And a third of the angels went with him. So this is why Satan, this is why our enemy is so, so set on us living out this power struggle to for us to fight against God, to fight against everything, to have things our own way. This was originated by Satan himself. So it's no surprise to me that he is hard at work, even to this day, trying to tempt us and tell us that we get to choose what's right and wrong. We get to say what's right and what's wrong. Whenever God's clearly outlined it, he's given us these guidelines, he's given us this opportunity for us to walk out a different way, to not be that person that is constantly having to call the shots for themselves, because this is the reality of it. We, God left a void in us to where without him, we really can't walk out this thing well. It's not possible. And so, but what's good about that is that we need, and when we do, call on him, that's when he makes us complete. 
that's when he gives us the grace. That's when he gives us the ability to walk this thing out, to win, to be victorious. Again, not that it's going to be easy, not that we're going to win every battle. God needs to develop some stuff in us through defeat as well. And so he'll do that. How many of you can attest to that that have walked with the Lord for a while? We've suffered some defeats, man. We've taken some hits, but this is the reality of it. God's going to bring us through. He'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. He'll never physically leave us, and he'll never emotionally withdraw from us. That's what that scripture means. He'll never leave us physically, and he'll never emotionally forsake us. He's there for us. Amen? You receive that tonight? Isn't that good? We can win this power struggle. We are victorious through surrender. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you, God, for this opportunity that we can come and just look into your word to hear from you. God, I know that tonight you've spoken to us. You've spoken to many of us. And so, Father, I pray that as you've done that, God, that you would just, with that word, give encouragement, give strength for each of us to surrender our will, to surrender our emotions to you, and thus gain victory in this human condition, this power struggle. Lord, help us, God. We need your help. We rely on you. We trust in you. We love you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Let's, let's thank God for his word tonight.